Okay, good evening, everybody. Today, we'd like to invite Dr. David Craig, who was actually my lecturer uh, in when I was studying in UKM as an undergrad. And I think that the part of it, uh, part of the reason why I became a cardiologist was also inspired by his teaching. Um, since then, he has gone on to become the president of MMA, the president of National Heart, maybe a few times round for National Heart, um, and a very, very active person in the social circle of all the cardiologists. Um, David, where are you? Yes, I'm here. Unfortunately, okay. I, I, I can see all of you except for my own face. My video is uh, seemingly not working uh, for some reason. Uh, but nevertheless, I think I can share with you uh, tonight. I think it's nice to see so many people check in. Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Yes, good to be here. Okay, maybe you can try to share your slides. Okay, I think we'll do that. Yeah, I don't know what happened actually. Mm. All right. So if the nurses can join um, our session on Facebook so that the doctors can join here, it would be good. Sorry, yeah? because I don't have enough space. Okay, good. So uh, Betty, if it's all right, I can sort of start yeah, first. Go, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, look, uh, today, uh, I think, uh, because I think this talk is actually not meant to be um, very very advanced okay because i think there are a lot of uh, doctors uh, mo's uh, and and so i i believe some nurses and healthcare professionals what i want to share with you are some basic fundamentals of must know sort of management for physicians what is meant by acute coronary syndrome okay what is new and what's current so these are my conflict of interest none for this particular one so what is acute coronary syndrome okay when you talk about acute coronary syndromes we're talking about chest pain syndrome that's related to myocardial ischemia. That means there's a lot of a gross mismatch of oxygen and blood supply and a demand to the myocardium, the heart cells, heart muscle cells. And uh, because of that, you know, it's, it's an unstable sort of a feature. Then you call it an unstable angina. But when there is an enzyme and damage to the heart muscle, then we call it a myocardial infarction. So when we look at it, there are two components here when you first need to define it correctly. Now, if you see here, you look at the ECGs here. These are, of course, uh, ST elevation changes. We are talking about these unstable features here. Okay, they're, they're at risk of very high for sudden death, for really bad heart attacks, growth, heart cardiac damage, and heart failure. On the other hand, there's another component, which is what we call the chronic coronary syndrome, the stable angina. Here, the risks are lower. But in the long term, it actually carries a similar risk to acute coronary syndromes as well. And there's also a increased risk of death. So just to share with you, this is not uh, new. If you remember, Shabby, uh, our footballer and then commentator, died. He was only 61 when he was cycling. A lot of people do not believe that they can actually have a heart attack. Okay, this is just one. Okay, then we heard about uh, uh, our cricketer, uh, Chris Wan, who is actually... Uh, I read Wayne Wan, for example, from Australia, who was in Thailand when he had a heart attack and then he died. Uh, some time ago, another uh, footballer, uh, goalkeeper, Peter Raja, died okay, in uh, 2014, also a heart attack. All of them under 60, and uh, actually one was actually only about um, 20, uh, 53 years old. So in other words, we know that even if you are a sports person before, it doesn't mean you're immune to heart attacks. In fact, we know that if you have been a very active person before and then you stop doing all the activity and you have high risk factors you're actually more prone to getting heart attacks so the spectrum is such okay we're talking about this particular group here called the acute coronary syndrome where the chest pain is a bit more acute meaning it's happening suddenly or progressively and it's usually due to inflammation of the coronary arteries on top of what you call atromas of the heart okay and then we cause the plug rupture erosion and then you go on to have what we call a non-ST elevation and ST elevation. This is based on EKG or ECG reading. And in order to call this a, a myocardial infarction, it must have some elevated troponins, which are actually the, the, the so-called muscle 
fibrils that are found inside your heart. Okay, and when that is leaking out, it means you have damage to the heart muscle. So this is one of the ways of looking at it. In the past, we used to talk about Q wave. I think Q wave is also important because it does tell you the amount of damage to the heart muscle. So when you're looking at this spectrum here, number one is that it's important to recognize this, okay? You actually have cholesterol to begin with. A lot of people think they don't, there's no cholesterol problem, there is. Okay, this is cholesterol here, these are the follicles inside here. And because there is a rupture, you can see it here, you tend to have an unstable angina if it doesn't totally occlude it. And here the troponin is negative, we call this an unstable angina. On the other hand, if you have changes, the plug fissure, and then you have this clot, and it's not a total occlusion usually, and you just mainly have ST depression changes and not ST elevation, they call it a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. And here, of course, you had damaged the heart muscle, the troponins are high. And of course, finally, when you have an occluded artery, there's ST elevation, and therefore we call it the ST elevation myocardial infarction, where the troponins usually are much higher. Okay, so when you look at the pathogenesis of ACS or acute coronary syndromes, we're talking about the start of a very clean artery. This may be when you're a young baby. Then later on, about five to 10 years old, you start getting a little bit of cholesterol depending on your food, okay? And later on, even in your 20s and 30s, depending on your risk factors, you tend to get more cholesterol build up. And then there's a bit of plug erosion. There's a microemboli thrombus, and you end up with a plug rupture and a myocardial infarction. This is a more complicated chart telling you how this actually process build up. There's some inflammation, but in order for this inflammation to start, often there is actually an overload of the LDL system, the cholesterol that actually triggers the entry into your cells. It overwhelms the immune response inside the vessel wall, and it triggers this so-called cytokines as well as inflammation, and therefore it creates more and more reactive responses, and then it's a buildup of the cholesterol plug over time. And at the end of the day, you end up with this uh, sort of a rupture in the, in the plug and the thrombus. Now, is this all real or is it just make-believe? It's real, okay? These are taken from people who have actually died. And we now know that in atherosclerotic plug, there's actually uh, uh, what you call the disrupture site here where the thrombus is seen here, for example. The thrombus can be sitting right across a very big plug here. Usually it's eccentric, meaning it is off-site rather than just a full-size center. And, and here again, you see... Uh, 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 the core of the art, the cholesterol core that is sometimes seen. Sometimes it is just over a calcified nodule, right? And this is what happens. Okay, in more graphic terms, you know there's a rupture. Usually there's a blood clot. And because of that, you know, it's taken really from a patient who actually died. You can see the clot inside here. And the patient is actually dead before we can do this uh, sort of pathology report. Again, uh, this is taken from a uh, a very famous uh, pathologist, uh, M.G. Davies from the uh, UK, and he actually documented this very well. Number one, you need to have coronary atherosclerosis. The most frequent cause of all ischemic heart disease. There's blood rupture or disruption. It's a superimposed thrombosis or clots, and it's the main cause of myocardial infarction and sudden death. And of course, it triggers inflammation as well. Okay, and this is actually triggered by the blood rupture and the fissure itself. And because of these endothelial breaks. And then there are inflammatory cytokines, metalloproteinoises, adhesion molecules, and it causes a cascade of changes that actually cause the blood artery to be blocked. So when we talk about it, there are two forms here. You'll notice there's a non-ST elevation, ACS, and there's a STEMI here, right? And there are now guidelines. This is from the ESC, which is one of the most current ones. Let me just share with you some of the points about unstable symptoms. Okay, it's important to recognize this. I think for doctors and even nurses, when you have chest pain, discomfort, or chest pressure, you must be remember that it's very important. Shortness of breath is sometimes complained about. There's nausea, there's vomiting, there's burping, there's a lot of gas, indigestion, there's dizziness, there's uh, cold sweats, you know, unusual exhaustion. Uh, sometimes a rapid heartbeat. Sometimes there's a feeling of dread, a fear. It may, of course, be caused by panic attack in some non-cardiac cases. And of course, in women, for some reason, you have a little bit more uh, stranger experiences, abdominal pain, anxiety. Occasionally, the pain is more sharp. And this is actually important. The chest discomfort, which sometimes people describe, is not necessarily pain, it's, but it's very uncomfortable. It occurs at rest. It changes from the moderate exertion to very mild activity. 
But then it occurs during sleep, waking because of the discomfort. And the frequency can increase sometimes from one to two per week to a few times a day. These are important changes. Okay, and then it can be prolonged from more than 13, 15, 30 seconds to minutes. And the discomfort doesn't go away even after a few minutes of rest or the use of uh, GPN or nitrate. So these are important unstable symptoms. Okay, So what's unlikely to be cardiac? I think this is important. A lot of people come to me. In fact, uh, just uh, yesterday, I got two patients that came and they're all non-cardiac pain. It's sharp, it's pin prick, it's twinges. It lasts just a few seconds. It can actually pinpoint onto the chest wall, the shoulder, costochondritis, musculoskeletal strain. Sometimes it precedes some excessive unusual activity over some joints. Okay, and this pain is aggravated by the specific movement of joints or breathing or even touch and pressure. Sometimes it's just a few seconds. It's very unlikely for heart pain to be just one or two seconds. Okay, It could be because of a twitch in the rhythm, but it's not a heart attack. It's flitting, it runs here or all over the place, and sometimes it's localized. These are not cardiac. Okay, Sometimes it's just too long. It lasts for hours on end, and the patient is happily walking around and carrying on with activity. It's very unlikely to be a very serious uh, sort of heart problem. Nevertheless, if it's in doubt, you must treat it as a possible cardiac cause. So these are just some of the characteristics that I want to share with you. The typical ST elevation actually is important. You, there can be convex upwards, it can be straight going up, it can be horizontal, it can be down sloping. And in fact, it goes on to getting this Q wave formation as well. You can see that it means there's a hole in the muscle in terms of electrical activity. And sometimes you see some of these changes called the lambda changes and the tombstone. There's a good reason for this. And having these two usually tends to portend for a worse prognosis. Now, if it's concave upwards, usually it is more benign. Okay, and this is the important point. And here is probably uh, what we call a reciprocal changes. You see these changes to ST elevation. In some of the reciprocal, it means opposite leads. For example, you can see ST depression. And this adds on to making your diagnosis better. I'll just share with you some cases in a while. Now, why do we treat ACS, specifically uh, STEMI, or ST elevation myocardial function? Because this is the most important one, sudden cardiac death. Okay? Usually from ventricular tachycardia and fibrillation, occasionally from silence arrest or a straight line is systole, there's cardiac rupture, there's valve damage, sometimes there's pulseless electrical activity and there's no pump action. And because of this, the patient stops breathing. You get anoxic stroke and disability. Sometimes you end up with a persistent vegetative state because of prolonged cerebral anoxia. Now, there's another problem following a heart attack. You damage the heart muscle too much, you end up with a cardiogenic shock, heart failure, LV dysfunction, there's aneurysm, pseudoaneurysm, there's rhythm disorders, which sometimes can be life threatening, complete heart block, AF. Okay, it's very important, BTAC, BF. And of course, later on, you start getting all these complications for major adverse cardiovascular or cerebral vascular events. And premature death is often a cause for ACS. So you can see this spectrum, which is exactly what I just given you in brief here. You can continue to have that. Occasionally, after a heart attack, some patients get chronic pericarditis called a restless syndrome. Now, let me just show you some examples. So this is a typical tombstone as LST elevation. And you, what is more serious is not just a pattern, but you can see it's right across the board. Okay, and it's very extensive with a lot of reciprocal changes in the reciprocal leads here. And this is actually a, a very bad sign, okay? On the other hand, you also can have this lambda pattern here. Again, also fairly widespread. This is an inferior lead. And here you see the reciprocal inverted lambda here, which is also pretty bad. Now, for those of you who have a sharper eye, you can see that the lateral leads are also involved, okay? Sometimes this is also another expensive sort of a right coronary artery, usually a very long circumflex artery disease. Now, there's another point that is actually new, and that's left bundle branch block pattern. Whenever you have left bundle branch block in the onset of chest pain, it's safer to assume that this is a myocardial infarction taking place. There's some criteria here, but today I don't have the time to tell you. One of these is a thing called the Scarbosa uh, criteria, where there are more than three points based on some of this ST elevation at certain points. Then it actually makes a uh, diagnosis a bit clearer. For example, here in the V1 to V3, this depression is more than one millimeter, for example, or in the ST elevation area, it's more than five millimeter in those leads, which is different from the usual uh, left under bunch block pattern, but this is ischemic in pattern. Now, having said that, uh, you can also have atrial fibrillation okay, in the context. This is very clear, rapid atrial fibrillation, but sometimes 
the, the, the AF is a bit less subtle, but you actually don't see any P wave here. But you still see this classical anterior septal uh, myocardial infarction, ST elevation myocardial infarction. Now, having said that, um, we also have what we call uh, ventricular tachycardia in uh, and the ST uh, elevation. And this is the inverted lambda, for example, that you can see. Okay, And you also see this pattern here, which is ventricular tachycardia, which is actually pretty bad. And from ventricular tachycardia, you can end up with this ventricular fibrillation here, and you actually end up uh, sometimes with a systole. All right? And uh, sometimes you have a complete heart block here, as you can see. And this is the rhythm that I think the CCU girls are always looking at. When you really try very hard to save somebody, the patient is dying, and you develop this agonal rhythm. Right? You see this uh, flat line almost. And once in a while, you just have a twitch, but actually the patient is not, is not uh, breathing anymore, is dead. So there are some ways of looking at the treatment here. But an important thing is that whenever you suspect ACS, okay, you need to look at the symptoms. The variation is more in women, okay, in older people with diabetes. Sometimes the pain is not so obvious, the discomfort. So you need to know whether there's ST elevation or non-ST elevation, or it's just unstable angina where you can actually be less urgent about it. But for non-ST elevation and STEMI, usually it's better to go straight into revascularizing the patient. I think this is important, all right? And remember what we told you, the troponin test determines whether this is a myocardial infarction or just an unstable angina, okay? So for example, when you actually look at this, I'm just going to take you through what our national heart actually has given you. Um, the management of ST elevation, the most current one is 2019. And I think when you look at it here, what I want you to bear in mind is that there are a few things you can do as a, as a doctor or even if you're at home. You can take one aspirin. Okay? That's helped you to begin. This is an antithrombotic. And because when you come into the emergency room, we also give you a full-size tablet, 300 milligrams of aspirin. And we now assess you to see whether things happen. But for you, if you're seeing a patient in your clinic, for example, be prepared to get an ambulance dispatched quickly. Okay? Look at the chest pain, especially when you can do an ECG and you detect it. Do not waste too much time. And if you think it is acute coronary syndrome, please make sure that the patient gets attention of the, the, the hospital very quickly. Now, we have a thing called a MyStemi network now. Okay, which is mainly in the Klang Valley. We have, I believe, one in Penang as well. And they're trying to start a few in uh, Para as well as in Johor. So what happens is that we have centers which can do PCI in which you should actually try and send most of your patients there. These are the few centers that are doing primary PCI. Besides the private hospitals where uh, Dr. Betty Tay and myself work, we actually do primary PCI. It's very important to get to the nearest hospital as quickly as you can. If you cannot, then you go to a non-PCI place where they can start some lytic therapy, for example. So this is what we mean by this flow chart here. When you can have a PCI-capable center, try and get there very quickly, draw to balloon time, 90 minutes, you must try and get the, uh, the patient revascularized. Okay? And especially if you are even better, get it within 30 minutes is even better. Right? Then you can get the best time and best results. On the other hand, if you do not have, then you may want to send the patient to some place where they actually can do what we call lytic therapy. Okay, these are some of the issues that you need to bear in mind. Now, one of the things that is important is this. Okay, when you're thinking about uh, angioplasty uh, or fibrinolytic therapy, you, you are two ways. Okay, for example, if you're in HKL, what they will offer for you is fibrinolytic therapy only. And then after this, they may transit you towards uh, another PCI, which is probably the best results. Okay, on the other hand, if it is over 12, 12 hours and you're still surviving that, you may want to go to another hospital where they can do a PCI, in which case you can take your time. This is the, there's really too much damage to the muscle, but it's still worth doing something about it. Okay, And there are treatments that you need to do. I'll come back to this in a little while. Okay? So even a bodybuilder like this guy uh, called Kali Masa, who was a convict before, he had a heart attack and had to be angioplasty. So just to tell you, that's not common. Okay, Malik No, remember, Mr. Asia, Mr. Universe, he also had a myocardial infarction while playing a, in a charity football match. So it's not something very new. Now, remember, time is muscle. Okay, Every time you have, every few minutes, you're losing it. So I just share with you one example here. This is a 42-year-old uh, dispatch rider from a local bank, suddenly complained of chest discomfort, near fainting, 
and sent by their colleagues to the emergency department. It's not aware of any health issues. He doesn't know anything. And, he, and within half an hour, he actually collapsed. If you just look at his ECG here, um, you see that this is when he first presented. It's not too obvious here. I think when you see this, maybe you see there's a bit of what you call a horizontality of the SP segment. But within that uh, uh, half an hour, he started getting this ST elevation in the anterior leaf with the reciprocal changes here. And very quickly, as we are preparing him to go into the cath lab, he became a full-blown STEMI, as you can see. It's very extensive here. And in fact, uh, just as we were going in, he developed VTAC, VF, and then he went into this. <laughs> okay, this is the nightmare. Now, if he were outside, he most likely would have died. That is why uh, we are now advising that the people can do this, do a... a, a DC shock to the patient. Okay, you can get this automatic uh, sort of a defibrillator, shock them out of it, otherwise the patient dies. So because of this, we're able to go in and you see it in this patient, he's not even 100% blocked, but it's pretty narrowed here. All right, and proximal LED, I'm just showing it for you. But it's a big artery, the right is normal. So we are able to go through and, uh, op and operate on him. And then we stented him and while we were intubating him and all that, you know, and he actually did pretty well with excellent results. So after the, the angioplasty, he survived. And after about three or four days, he actually went home. Right? He found out to be diabetic and all that. So we managed to salvage some uh, muscle because you can see that uh, the V5 and V6 still has the R wave here, right? So that's him. He's got a lot of problems. He ended, ended up with knowing that he's got diabetes, he's got hypertension, his cholesterol was actually pretty high. Look at the A1C, it's also not good, okay? So LDL was actually uh, about seven in the beginning. So that is um, this guy. Then uh, there's another chap. Okay? He was playing futsal. He just imagine that you're a young guy. He's only 35 years old. He comes in and he actually collapsed while playing chest pain. He went to a GP clinic first and he referred him. And then this is what we found. Okay? It's a classic ST elevation. And this is just to show you the changes in the cardiac enzymes that actually take place. Uh, when he came in in the evening, he actually had chest pain around 5.30. You notice he wasted quite a lot of time. By the time we, we started seeing him at around uh, after 9, 10 o'clock, his enzymes were already up. Okay, and then of course it went up further. So we are able to actually uh, operate for him as well. And you can see that his artery here is actually 100% blocked here. In fact, if you look at it, it should be there. Okay, just to show you where the artery is, LAD. So we're able to go through it. We find there's a few more narrowing along the place. We touch it up. And finally, we are able to open up the artery very nicely. And the patient actually does very, very well. Okay, this is immediately after the angioplasty, and uh, this is him now. He's with me for the last uh, seven, eight years, and he's actually doing very well. So when we are talking about um, angioplasty, that is probably the best result because that gives you the lowest, uh, worst outcomes. Whereas if you use fibrinolytic therapy, which is the most common form of treatment in Malaysia uh, in 70% of the patients, um, it's still useful because if you can actually get the patient to come in within... Uh, 120 minutes, and then you start giving this uh, fibrinolytic therapy. And nowadays, it's usually a TNK. Uh, then the patient actually can get some revascularization. Not the highest rate, but probably around 70-80%. And the patient can do better. So you need to come in early as well. But the narrowing, if it is there, normally needs to be addressed later on. And you still think about uh, angioplasty uh, soon, all right, rather than later. Now, unfortunately, in Malaysia, a lot of patients who had fibrinolytic therapy or lytic therapy, they end up just going home because there's uh, no facility to allow them to go for a, a, what they call a pharmacoinvasive or a delayed sort of PCI. But mostly private hospitals actually uh, have this approach nowadays, which is to do a primary PCI or a PCI much earlier. And the results are actually better. So the level of evidence is actually very, very good. If you can have do a primary angioplasty or PCI within a time frame that's the best, and it's all class 1A. All right, the second is still pretty good because there's a lot of good evidence as well. If you can actually get it in, it's still a 1A indication. Now, the other treatment that you may want to consider and I've highlighted for you is to consider this anti thrombotic. Remember, the clot play a very important role in uh, myocardial infarction, so aspirin and clopidogrel becomes important. Ticagrelo and Prasugrel are the newer ones here. Unfortunately, they've uh, removed Prasugrel from our thing because the company withdrew the drug here. On the other hand, we also may want to use some of these uh, antithrombotics. Uh, these are all the uh, 
subcutaneous ones that you can use. And they may be useful in some cases where you need to thin down the blood a little bit more. Now, when the patient goes home, usually, or during even admission, if the patient don't have a heart block or whatever, in, in terms of atrial ventricular conduction, we need, you can give a beta blocker. You usually want to start an ACE inhibitor or a RAS blocker and high dose tatin, which sometimes protect the heart. The ACE inhibitor is to prevent further remodeling and development of LD aneurysm and heart failure. Important things to consider, you must stop the patient from smoking, need to encourage exercise. You need to consider aspirin and clopidogrel at least for a certain time. It used to be said that you need to use this for at least 12 months. Most of us will still give it in the setting for standing, all right? Whereas uh, you may want to remove one or two of them if there's an increased risk of bleeding. On the other hand, these are drugs that need to be continued because they're protective, all right? So beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, statins is actually a must. And we want to reduce the statin to as low as possible. In our Malaysian guidelines, we say 1.8, but I think most other conditions in the uh, guidelines now mention 1.4. Now, what about this non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome? This is where you don't get the ST elevation, but it's still pretty bad. I'll give you an example here. This was a patient who first presented to me at 49 years old with some atypical chest pain. We had tread test, the treadmill stress test, it was actually quite normal. But she's a smoker, right? A 15-pack smoker, strong family history, and she was lost to follow up until about six years later. And then he came back this time with a resting uh, sort of a angina. You know? And I think if you look at it, the ECG is quite typical. I just want to show it to you um, here. Okay, you look at it, this is a patient walking in. You don't need to do a stress test when you see this kind of ST depression. Okay, you can see it uh, quite a lot here. So because of that, you know, we did the angiogram for him. We find that the patient has got a lot of grotty disease. I'll just highlight for you, these are... Uh, some of the narrowing that we can actually see in this artery is a lot of calcification. Uh, so that in the end, we have to do uh, from the radio, in other words. Okay? So we're able to actually put in some stents here, and it looks a lot better here. But I just want to highlight the point is sometimes you cannot do so much. It's very hard. You can put in the stents in the main artery. But for example, you can actually see that there are some other areas which are also narrowed, but you don't usually fully revascularize the smaller blood vessels because it's not the best option for this patient. And the patients actually had some recurrent chest pain where you needed more medical therapy, which you almost always need anyway. All right. So I think we need to consider this more importantly, that patients don't get treated and then the, you stop there. You need to treat them for a longer period. So the patients may need, for example, added therapies. And unfortunately, a lot of patients with uh, uh, sort of unstable symptoms and with a lot of co-hosts and comorbidities, they end up with a lot of polypharmacy, but that cannot be helped, all right? I think it's important to bear that in mind. So I think one of the things that I want to emphasize here is just remember about the troponins, all right? It's a rise and fall, but the presence of troponin now is very sensitive. You can measure with high sensitivity a troponin. Even a small leak, you can tell, and the, the discovery is actually not good. It's a very bad risk, okay? So it's very important for you to bear that in mind. Now, acute chest pain syndrome is what you normally do, but there's also a low-risk patients that we want to talk about. Here, you can actually do a stress test. If you don't see much changes, you're not very sure of the uh, ECG changes, then you may want to do that. All right, and then later on, uh, you, if you're still very equivocal, you're not very sure, you may still need to do an invasive formangiogram because having a heart attack is no joke. All right, so just to tell you about uh, acute coronary syndrome, even if it is a non stemi and unstable, it's, it's not benign. Okay, for example, if you look at the, our national registry, this is our national registry here. These are the two here. These are from other cases, but we have a pretty good registry here. To tell you that our in hospital mortality is still pretty high, although it's lower elsewhere. Okay, it's about seven eight percent, and the thirty days up to about 10, 11 percent. But look at that one year mortality is still about 24%, about one in four. So bear in mind that this is not, not good to have. So most of the post-discharge treatment for ACS will be some kind of uh, antithrombotic aspirin, plus minus clopidogrel, a high intensity statin, to try and lower it down to, minus, to less than 1.4, 1.8. You need to optimize the treatment for hypertension, diabetes, as well as uh, LDL. An ongoing, uh, ongoing angina treat with a lot of medications you can use on tromotazidine, gravidine, long acting nitrates, venalazine. And if you've got heart failure or ejection fraction is lower, beta blocker, ACE blockers are important, 
MRAs, which are like spironolactone, lactone, which is very cheap, and nowadays is SGLT2. Okay, and then we need to review and we evaluate periodically. It is very important to bear that in mind. Okay, once in a while you need to do that. So remember this chart here. Okay, you are talking about seeing patients here or here, but remember that it's actually a spectrum over a period of time. Okay, so we can actually try, try and change this spectrum. So for example, you just take a look at uh, my first patient. We first had that STEMI there. So what do we do next? And this is a sort of a treatment, the long-term treatment that we need to give to him, right? Make sure you control the BP, the diabetes, the LDL, and make sure the angina is resolved. Make sure the glycemic control is good. Weight management, keep smoking, exercise. And the, the role of antiplatelets over time can be reduced. Now, this is uh, for Christine, the other girl who is unstable angina. What do we do? Even after we angioplasty her, she continues to have chest pain. We just need to maximize some of the medical therapy a little bit more. Okay, so I think I just want to end by just telling you that uh, man is very funny. He sacrifices his health in order to make money. He sacrifices money to recuperate his health. So anxious about the future, he does not enjoy the present. And the result is that he does not live to the present or the future. And he lives as if he's never going to die. And then he dies, not really uh, having lived. So this is Baba Dalai Lama. And I, with that, I want to thank you for my sharing with you. Our task and responsibility as physicians is to ensure that ACS stricken patients are safe. So it must be timely, must be appropriate medical care, and we can try and improve the survival and uh, reduce the complications and improve the quality of life. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, thanks, David. That was a very short and uh, sweet talk. Um, firstly, um, do you think you can get your your camera working? <laughs> I, I, I'm just trying. I don't know why they don't want to see my face for some reason. Okay, we take questions from here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If there's any question, just uh, shout out or you can put it in the chat box as well. Okay, let me just share what they want most. Okay. Let me share the screen here. Yeah? Share screen. Okay, this is one. So basically, there are two. Um, Okay, this is the QR code for the doctors. Okay, so maybe you all can put in your questions. Okay, I have a question. Oh, sorry. Uh, I have a question. Uh, how difficult it is, is it to get the uh, streptokinase these days? I find it very difficult. Is oh, it available yeah. in your hospital? We have, but uh, I think now we, we practically stopped that because uh, nobody is using it. So we are actually using TNK in some patients, uh, but not very often. But TNK, uh, which is uh, tenactiplase, is actually being used in all the government hospitals. Oh, how much does it cost? Uh, a couple of thousand, I think. Yeah, compared to yeah. streptokinase. Yeah, streptokinase right? is, is available as well, but I think most of it are bought by the government's, government's Yeah, uh, sort of I find it's not available in most yeah. private hospitals. But it's... I, was one of the first to use it in the in HKL in the uh, late eight, in the early eighties, and I must tell you that the the reperfusion rate is actually not nearly as high, maybe sixty percent. Yes, of course, of course. But sometimes, uh, mm. due to the fact that patients cannot afford, uh, sometimes we, yeah. uh, I find some patients need to be transferred. So, um, we, do you know to government sector and then. The wait is long, so sometimes yeah. it is unfortunately it's actually very long. I must yeah, tell you that right. patients waiting almost one, one week or more to get uh, you know some kind of procedure yeah. done in when it's so done. I mean sometimes we just have no choice. Oh, sorry. Okay, this is the QR code for the nurses. Okay, uh, you can scan and then register yourself, and this will then uh, we will then send you an e cert. Is there no question at all? Okay, I, I did not make it very complicated because I know there's actually another more complicated session coming up in about two or three weeks' time uh, okay. where they're going to talk about the registry, the MyStemi network and all that uh, by quite a few doctors, I think from IJN as well as from CVs and trolls. So I, I purposely do not want to make it very complicated. Okay, we, yeah, we have a series uh, of cardiology topic. The next four... Uh, Webinars are actually a series of uh, cardiology topic. Um, this is ACS, 
acute coronary syndrome. Okay, I think the take home messages. Uh, maybe you'd like to give us some take home messages. Yeah, I, I think one of the important things to mention is that you have to consider uh, to have a high index of suspicion. Okay, chest pains are very, very important. I think this is an important thing to bear in mind. And it's not just chest pain, chest discomfort. Okay, so I think you need to bear that in mind for, for doctors huh? because I, I sometimes get a, a, a GP. Now, these GPs are, are getting a bit brighter. They do send you know, high uh, side index of suspicion, but occasionally it's dismissed because you tend to underestimate the, the breathing problem, for example. Some people talk about effort dyspnea, which is now recognized as one of the potential uh, sort of chest discomfort syndromes that may be related to what we call myocardial ischemia or angina. Okay, I okay. think uh, more importantly is uh, maybe we like to tell, uh, say to the GPs that in diabetic patients, a lot of patients actually present with epigastric pain. Mm. Uh, sometimes they get treated for um, reflux or gastritis mm. and um, yeah, and the the uh, uh, they are missed. Okay, yep. fine. Indigestion is actually very frequently yeah, a, right. a problem. So just remember, I, I gave you a few uh, of those uh, presentation points that you need to look at. But I think the other point I want to bear in, uh, to emphasize here is if you really suspect that this patient is really unwell, do not take too long. Ask the patient to take a taxi or take an ambulance, go to the nearest emergency hospital. Sometimes I think uh, you say you come back later or you wait too long in the clinic, uh, the patient may actually collapse. And by the time you reach the emergency department, it, some of the patients actually, you know, are moribund or dying. It's very hard. What about recurrent atypical chest pain? Oh, okay. Then I, I think I, uh, I saw that question there. Um, in those patients, usually you have to exclude a lot of other uh, chest pain syndromes. It could be from the mark, from the, chest wall, I give you a few lists of those as well. It can be from the joints, can be from the ribs, can be from the muscle, can be from the shoulder, can be cervical spondylosis, you know, a few of these things. Sometimes in a rare case, it's from herpes zoster and all that. So you need to exclude some of these things. So it's a good to have a good examination as the patient to strip at least from the waist up and you know what's going on with the patient. Okay, and uh, normally if they, are, if they are negative, the troponin is negative the risk for things happening uh, in the next one to two weeks usually is very low. Okay, so I think uh, it's very unlikely to be uh, something that is very bad. But again, it depends on your index of suspicion. If, for example, they've got a strong family history, a father or a mother or a, or a sibling eh, who has a myocardial infarction and died suddenly, anything around 50 to 60 years old, that's considered early. And then you must be having a stronger index of suspicion that this may be it's more than just that. Yeah. Mm. It could be stable angina. Mm. So, um, Dr. Jasprit, I think, I'm a GP. I have a few patients less than 30 years old with high LDL. Um, if it's more than four, despite uh, lifestyle modification, would you treat it? Uh, you're asking one of the big proponents for lowering LDL. Okay, I am one of them. Um, I, I believe very much in the um, the genetic uh, cause of uh, high cholesterol. Okay, and in fact, uh, when you have an LDL of four and above, you are probably having a form of uh, heterozygous hypercholesterolemia. Okay, in fact, uh, we see a lot of patients in that range. And if there's a family history, a strong family history, there's no way you can bring it down by lifestyle modification. But if there's no family history, no other risk factors, you can watch them, but you will find that they will not change. Now, one of the reasons why I advocate treating the LDL to come down to a more reasonable number below 2.6, for example, in the young people, is because of this thing called the, the LDL burden over time. So if you leave the patient there, say he's 30 years old and the LDL is four, and you leave him for another 10, 15 years, it's enough time for the LDL to cause a lot more damage to the arterial wall. So I would rather you bring down the LDL uh, 
may, sometimes a low dose uh, statin and it may work for the patient and it will help the patient live longer. Yeah, I think... my, my own LDL is uh, 1.3 to 1.4. Oh, not because I, of anything, but I, it's just a kiasi, kiasu kind of a attitude that I have. I see so many patients, uh, you know, 3.2 and I have a STEMI. I mean, so that's one of the things. So basically, we, we do advocate the primary prevention for high mm. LDL in patients without a previous history of uh, coronary artery disease. I myself actually take uh, statin. <laughs> Okay, I think nine. I think I did a survey uh, some years back, uh, just a few years back, and I thought I think about ninety five percent of cardiologists are taking a statin. Okay, it's <laughs> it is just like um, okay, it's just like you wanting to be looking youthful outside. How do you make your vessels look youthful inside? Inside, yes, uh, yes, that's yes. a good point. That's why I always tell my uh, yeah. So when you have uh, you know, like pigmentation, melasma. Outside, inside is worse. So I, I always try to take statin, but only if, only if they give me samples. <laughs> oh, I think we all can afford it. Let me, let me tell you about some of the costs of some of the statins now. Most of them are, are up to about 10 or 20 milligrams. Okay, it's about at the most 30 ringgit to 40 ringgit, the, the generics lah. You know, so it's actually relatively cheap now. I mean, if you don't have, I mean, if I have a, a, a an event, I probably want to take the original because I want to be very sure of the drug. But if not, okay, as long as it works for me, there are some good generics out there, take it. And if the levels come down, it's working for you. And that's good enough. Okay. Uh, wait, somebody asked for, are you, I don't know how to shift my, this one very well. Uh, okay, so. let me see the chart. They want the, the nurses... Okay. Uh, no, they want the doctor's QR code. Yeah, this is the doctor QR code. Okay. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah okay. you can scan also. Uh, okay. So, uh, David, you can also scan. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I know you have loads of points, but I'll scan. Mm. Okay. So, um, any more questions? It looks like... Um, please join us next week. Next week, we have a Q... No. Sudden cardiac death. So sudden cardiac death, uh, we will talk about arrhythmias. Most probably, we will also touch on the, the increase in sudden cardiac death in the COVID situation, uh, which is actually quite more commonly seen these days. Okay, uh, Dr. Ko asks, oh, what does Dr. Hidayatola say, CT angios ACS? What does that mean? While you try to elaborate, we ask, we take Dr. Kwa's question. A lot of patients are much affected by social media, in particular by cardiologists' advice against primary treatment of high cholesterol. Huh? Is that, well, is that possible? I don't know of any bona fide cardiologists who do that. Lah. But they, if you ask me, there will always be some... Uh, uh, I wouldn't say there'll be a lot, okay? There'll be always some, some uh, rare persons who do not believe in the, the cholesterol theory. They believe it's all inflammation, which is actually a lot of bunkum. If you actually understand um, the theory for why you, or not theory, I mean the hypothesis, which is much stronger than a theory about the pathology of uh, coronary uh, arteriosclerosis, there's actually no doubt in my mind about what you actually can do to modify the disease. I suspect, uh, Dr. Ko, are you the uh, Dr. Ko from uh, Public Health and uh, that I know? Uh, I, I, I respect that, uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think uh, it's up to you to, to believe one way or the other. Uh, okay. We normally do not do CT angio okay. in acute coronary syndromes unless it is a typical sort of chest pain and you're not very sure or you have equivocal sort of a stress test in acute coronary syndrome, like non-ST elevation or ST elevation myocardial infarction, uh, you must do more than a CT angio. It's not yeah. a rule out, rule in thing. Uh, yeah, there's no point doing a CT angio in uh, mm. acute coronary syndrome. You already have made a diagnosis of ACS and therefore um, you must go ahead to do an angiogram because it's, if a doctor does 
CT angel and then go and do angel. He's just trying to make money out of the patient, I believe. Anyway, okay, there's another point from uh, just, just Prit, I think they say that uh, it's difficult to convince younger patients to take. I agree with you. It's very hard. But yes. uh, my point is very simple. Uh, if there are actually no symptoms at all, what you can do is advise them first. But you'll notice that you can try all your lifestyle. Your LDL is going to hover between four. If you start with four, okay, you're going to be hover. Sometimes you get to 3.7, sometimes 3.6. Then you go up to 4.2. It's not going to change very much. Now, what is important is that if you understand the, 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 the long-term mechanism about how LDL works, then you perhaps understand why I'm such a proponent for it. Now, one of the better ways, especially if patients have got some uh, high cholesterol with a high CV risk, for example, uh, they have parents who've got a hypertension with diabetes or premature ischemic heart disease, is to do, in this case, what you call a calcium score. And this is where the, the CT scan is very important. If you can find calcium in your arteries at 30 years old, you're in bad trouble because you need uh, atherosclerosis to be able to get the calcium calcification of your heart artery. And, and then if it's worse than that, you may need to do a CT angio. This is where I use it. And then the patients become convinced because it's not just that. It's just not for me. They remember that all of the treatment is actually for the patients, you know, because whenever we treat, I think Betty and I, we do, is after we treat them, it's all up to you whether you want to live longer or not because we can only advise you. And the same thing you should uh, tell your patients as well. It takes a little bit of time to explain to the patient, but um, I think it is not um, difficult to convince the patients. Yes, because statin, I do not know why, has been getting a lot of bad publicity, maybe because people are trying to sell supplements, I'm not sure. But statin of all the drugs seems to get more bad publicity over the social media more than anything else. Yeah, but I think I, one of the important things is because of social media. I think social media can be very destructive. I think you can see that uh, already. I mean, there are good things like you know beating hearts and whatever, but but there are lots of other nonsense that are going on. Okay, for example, if you don't believe me, you can do this. I've done this before. Uh, every time I give a talk about statins and acceptance, if you type in and put their statin benefits, you may get about three hundred thousand sort of hits. Okay, and these are on top of people buying in already, okay? About three 300,000, I think, uh, in Google. Go to Google. Uh, Bing doesn't give you very much. Okay, then if you type in harms of statin, you get 3 point something, 4 million. So you will think that the harms are actually more than the, the benefits, but all the harms that you come out from there are from nutritionists, supplement sellers, Dr. Yeah. Mercola, and a few other nut jobs. Okay, there's another guy who is a so-called cardiac surgeon, which I must bring up because you say, well, he's a renowned cardiac surgeon, but no, he's not. The one who's writing about no cholesterol, uh, you know, and he's been selling his book. I think it's 4990. Um, and the reason is that he's doing it is because he was a cardiac surgeon who was actually deregistered in two, three states in America because he, he bumped up all his surgery. So you must be careful about who you, you, you look at your patients and your, your doctors and your reference point. It is okay. very important because, um, of course, the bulk of the evidence of uh, statin is actually on secondary prevention, but there is also evidence on primary prevention. And the numbers that have been of patients that have been recruited for, for statin trials, I think, is huge. Yep. It comes out of millions. If, if we have time, let me, let me see whether I can find one of my slides for you on statins, which is actually very, very useful. I think if I can share that with you, just a moment. Huh? Do, 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 do. Oops, is there any more okay, No, let me just go on first. Yeah, never mind. Let's just stop there for a while. Mm. You can go on if you want, if it won't take too long. No, no, it's not. I, I, you just carry any more questions. Yes, yeah, if there is, I will answer. Mm. Okay, if not, we will stop here yeah. and then join us next week. Mm, for another session. I think next week it will be Poisson, but um, uh, Dr. Aslan has kindly decided to give us the talk anyway. He didn't realize it was Poisson. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much, David. I meet you up 
I think maybe during na National Heart. Yeah. And if you all want, okay, Serena has a question. I recently saw a 30 year old lady morbidly obese. Uh, not something new, you know, just being obese. I see a lot of patients with BMI of 35 to 45 these days. Mm -hmm. LDL of three, pre diabetic. So, three. Well, three. Three, three is always the harder number to, to yeah, treat. I right. think the the the, will be, the obesity needs to be tackled. That's what for one thing for sure. Um, having said that, we actually have patients. Uh, I haven't seen it, but I think we have seen presentations from, uh, for example, the government hospitals and IJN where they are 30, 22 years old, uh, even women uh, with, uh, with diabetes or pre-diabetes and borderline uh, sort of LDL and hypertension. And they actually come in with uh, myocardial infarction as well. We have all seen uh, results of that as well. So just bear that in mind when you see patients like that. We can't give you a blanket answer for what we can do for the patient. Um, I'm actually more and more interested in recommending to patients who are morbidly obese, a BMI of say above 35 to 40 and above, to think about some bariatric surgery, you know, such as putting in a little pump inside the stomach to reduce the stomach can actually help the patient a lot. Yeah, Very I found important. that bariatric surgery is really a miracle of the it will help with the diabetes as well. It will help with a lot of things. It will help with the patient's confidence. It will help with, yes, motivation and diabetes and all the metabolic disorder. But uh, to answer Serena, if a patient is diabetic or pre-diabetic, that doesn't, you know, the sugar is maybe six, seven, um, and the LDL is three, I would rather treat the LDL that, that uh, and start on some low dose and bring it down to below 2.6. Not necessarily 1.8 and definitely no need for 1.4, but I would like it to be below 2.6, definitely. Dr. Ko is asking you for yeah, the... I, I, I can't remember the name offhand because uh, the last one I gave the talk was uh, some time ago. But if you just type in a deregistered cardiac surgeon, deregistered cardiac surgeon, I think from University of Arizona, uh, and... Um, and cholesterol, you'll get his name. I think it's Mervin something. I guess I cannot remember. Okay, I'm going to stop. Uh, okay. Yes. Stop share now. Okay. okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. I'll see you one of these days, yeah. Okay. okay bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. We stop recording now. Bye.